today uh, we're going to talk about neuromuscular blockers. So it's neuromuscular blockers is a title which comes under the subject of anesthesia. Basically, it's under the topic of skeletal muscle relaxants. And skeletal muscle relaxants are basically divided into two parts, two major parts, which are the neuromuscular blockers and also the spasmolytics. The neuromuscular blocking drugs act at the skeletal myoneural junction. It acts at the skeletal myoneural junction and they are used to produce muscle paralysis to facilitate surgery or assisted ventilation. So neuromuscular blocking drugs act at the skeletal myoneural junction and it produces muscle paralysis. It paralyzes the muscle and by paralyzing the muscles, this facilitates in surgery and it also facilitates assisted ventilation, meaning that you assist the patients for the ventilation. So there are two main groups of skeletal muscle relaxants, the neuromuscular blockers and the spasmolytics. So the neuromuscular blockers can be divided into two groups, the non-depolarizing group and also the depolarizing group. Basically, the depolarizing group produces depolarization. I hope that you still remember what depolarization is all about, which is under the subject of action potential, which is under the which which is one of the topics taught in physiology. So we have one that induces its actions by causing depolarization. And this group, the main drug is called succinylcholine, which is also known as choline or succimethonium. Succimethonium. So succimethonium, succinylcholine, scholine or sux, they are all the same thing. They are referring to the same drugs. They are under the group of depolarizing neuromuscular blockers. They depolarize the neuromuscular junction. And the other group is called the non-depolarizing neuromuscular blocker. The non-depolarizing neuromuscular blockers are divided into two long-acting. Actually, you can divide them, them into three if you, you, if you want. But for, for the ease of explaining things, we will divide them into two. The short-acting one, such as vivacurium, and we also have the long-acting ones, such as tubercurine. So this is how we, the general idea about skeletal muscle relaxants, and this is where neuromuscular blockers come in to picture. So we, we are today only going to talk about neuromuscular blockers. We're not going to talk about the spasmolytics. So the spasmolytics, again, they are divided into two, the ones for acute use and the ones for chronic use. And the chronic use, we divide them, we divide them into where they act. So the first group, they act in the CNS, the central nervous system. So the group of drugs include baclofen, diazepam, which is, a, which is a, an anxiolytic, which is a benzodiazepine, diazepam, and which is also used for um, as an anti-epileptic, and we have tizanidine, so we have the CNS action drugs, and also we have the muscle action drugs, which is gentrolene. So the depolarizing agents,
historically, so historic, a bit of history about the neuromuscular blockers. Um, in 1942, Griffith and Johnson suggested that d tubercularine DTC is safe during surgery. And that in 1952, Feslev and Folders introduced, introduced succinylcholine. And then subsequently, about 15 years after that, um, pancuronium was introduced into the market, followed by um, mivacurium in the 1990s. So mivacurium is the first short-acting, non-depolarizing neuromuscular blocker. Remember from what I mentioned in the previous slide that we have basically um, the non-depolarizing neuromuscular blockers can be divided at least into two or three groups. We have the short-acting and the long-acting group. So we are talking about here the short-acting non-depolarizing neuromuscular blocker, mivacurium. Short-acting, so this is mivacurium where it comes to place. And then we have procuronium, which is an intermediate. So we have, I've not mentioned um, mivac that group in this um, this table in this um, skeletal representation of things because of a lack of space but basically we have procuronium which is an intermediate um, acting non-depolarizing neuromuscular blocker which was introduced in the 90s so why do we use neuromuscular blockers why do we use why do I bother about neuromuscular blockers neuromuscular blockers are used routinely to facilitate endotracheal intubation and mechanical ventilation. So we use neuromuscular blockers to assist us in intubating patients. I'm sure that you have watched on TV or probably you have been to the wards or clinics and saw people doing intubation, which is very important in our daily medical practice, especially in certain um, departments of the hospital, especially in the emergency department, in the medical department, and also in the operating theatres. And also when emergency happens in other wards or in other settings, in the hospital or outside the hospital. So we have to use neuromuscular blockers. We use it routinely to, to help us in doing endotracheal intubation and also to assist mechanical ventilation. Mechanical ventilation, is, as the name implies, is ventilation which is not um, voluntary, it's not done by the body, but it's being assisted by the machine. So that's why the name mechanical ventilation. And we also use the neuromuscular blockers to maintain neuromuscular blockade during surgical procedures. So during surgery, you want to maintain, you have blocked the neuromuscular junction, but you want to maintain it, so you use a neuromuscular blocker, such as one of the drugs that we have mentioned in the previous slides. So what are the principles of action of neuromuscular blockers at the neuromuscular junction? So basically, we have what is called as the post-junctional effects. So we have the neuromuscular junction. So what happens at the junction? So in adult mammalian skeletal muscle, the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, NACHR, which is a pentameric complex. Pentameric means it has uh, five um, dimensions to the complex with two alpha and one beta, one delta, and one epsilon subunits. So these subunits form a transmembrane pore or channel and extracellular binding pockets for acetylcholine and other agonists and antagonists. And each alpha subunit has an acetylcholine binding site. You can refer to this picture in um, Katzung or other pharmacology textbooks. So functionally, functionally what happens is the ion channel of the acetylcholine receptor, the ion channel is closed in the resting state. So during the resting state, the channel is closed, it's not open. But when you have binding, two simultaneous bindings of 
two acetylcholine molecules to the alpha subunits, this will start changes at that junction which will lead to the opening of the channel, which is the ion channel. Okay, that's for the acetylcholine molecules. But, but, when we talk about non-depolarizing neuromuscular blocker, we only need one molecule. We don't need two molecules in order to bind to the subunit and produce blockade of the neuromuscular junction. So depolarizing neuromuscular blockers. Depolarizing neuromuscular blockers, example succinylcholine, produce prolonged depolarization of the end plate region. So we have the succinylcholine, which is the depolarizing neuromuscular blocker. So let's go back to the previous slide. So we have the neuromuscular blockers, you have the depolarizing ones and non-depolarizing ones. So now we're talking about the depolarizing one, which is succinylcholine, for example. And it's probably it's the only depolarizing neuromuscular blocker which you need to know about. So depolarizing neuromuscular blockers produce prolonged depolarization of the and plate region, which results in first desensitization of the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. So it desensitizes the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, and then it also inactivates. It inactivates. It deactivates the, vo the voltage-gated sodium channels at the neuromuscular junction. And it increases permeability to potassium in the surrounding membranes. So when you have this, you inactivate the voltage-gated sodium channels, you, you, and you increase the potassium permeability. So the end result is failure of action potential generation, and blockade ensues. So when you, when, you, 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 if you, when you don't have action potential generation, when action potential does not happen, so you don't have neuromuscular junction transmission. So there is no more transmission of charges or there is no transmission at the neuromuscular junction and when there is no development of action potential, so we have blockade. So you have the neuromuscular junction being blocked. And then, after you know that the acetylcholine, uh, which which has bound, which is bound to the to the receptor, then the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. So acetylcholine is rapidly hydrolyzed. It is hydrolyzed rapidly by acetylcholinesterase to acetic acid and choline. So prejunctional receptors are involved in modulating the, relief or the release of acetylcholine in the neuromuscular junction. And we know that we have both nicotinic and mascarinic receptors that exist on the motor nerve endings. Bowman, the scientist, suggested that the prejunctional nicotinic receptors are activated by acetylcholine and function in a positive feedback control system that serves to maintain the availability of acetylcholine when demand for it is high, example during tetany. So how do you monitor neuromuscular function? In the operating room or ICU, the depth of neuromuscular blockade is typically monitored by observing the response to stimulation of any superficially located neuromuscular unit. 
So most commonly, we monitor the, con the contraction of the adductor pollicis muscle, which is associated with stimulation of the ulnar nerve, either at the wrist, the wrist, or at the elbow. We monitor it. And in certain circumstances, depending on patient positioning, when access to the patient's arms may be limited, or because of the nature of the patient's injury, the peroneal nerve or the facial nerve may be monitored. So basically, usually we monitor the adductor pollicis muscle, but, but sometimes we might monitor other places. So all neuromuscular blockers, neuromuscular blockers are related, are structurally related to acetylcholine. And the depolarizing neuromuscular blocker, which is succinylcholine, is composed of two molecules of acetylcholine linked back to back through the acetate methyl groups. And like acetylcholine, succinylcholine stimulates cholinergic receptors at the neuromuscular junction and at nicotinate, that is ganglionic and muscarinic autonomic sites, thereby opening the ionic channel in the acetylcholine receptor. Succinylcholine is the only available neuromuscular blocker with a rapid onset of effect and a very short duration of action. It has an ultra short duration of action. An administration of 1 mg per kg of succinylcholine results in complete suppression of response to neuromuscular stimulation in approximately 1 minute. And in patients with genotypically normal butyral cholinesterase, which is also known as plasma cholinesterase or pseudocholinesterase activity. So patients who have normal butyral cholinesterase activity, re recovery to 90% of muscle strength after the administration of 1 mg per kg succinylcholine requires 9 to 13 minutes. So if someone is 60 kg, he's, he's, he weighs 60 kg and so how much you administer? You administer about one milligram. If and you want to administer one milligram per kg, then you will give the patient sixty milligrams of succinylcholine. So what happens is that the muscle, which has been blocked, we will, it will recover to ninety percent of the muscle strength after nine to thirteen minutes. And the short duration of action of succinylcholine is due to its rapid hydrolysis by butyrylyl cholinesterase to succinyl, monocholine, and also choline. Okay, that's all for today with regards to succinyl, choline, and also the neuromuscular blockers and the depolarizing and non-depolarizing neuromuscular blockers. I'll see you in the next sessions. Thank you for watching.